Good afternoon, everybody. How is everybody? Good. Uh, I would be remiss to not start this by first asking everybody if we could give a round of applause for Myhin for putting this conference on. This is a huge group of people, so thank you very much. Probably one of the biggest groups I've ever talked in front of, so bear with me. Uh, my name is Tom Curtis, and I'm going to go through uh, the State Innovation Model Project for uh, Michigan. And I have about 26 minutes to get through th these items here. So I'm going to start with vision overview, goals, objectives, uh, give you a sense of our strategic approach, and I might throw a story or two in there as well. Uh, and I'll round it up with some updates and timeline information for everybody. So our vision uh, for our state innovation model project for Michigan is uh, very simple, uh, but complicated at the same time. We want to improve and ensure care coordination within and across medical settings, uh, but we also want to link those medical settings out into the community for resources that will address social determinants of health. Uh, and this vision really dates back to, uh, at least from a SIM context, uh, the year 2013. So in 2013, Michigan brought together a number of stakeholders, payers, providers, universities, health coalitions, uh, aging, mental health, public health, uh, et cetera, to put together what uh, was called the Michigan Blueprint for Health Innovation. And this was really a conceptual framework for how would Michigan's healthcare and community stakeholders work together moving forward for, uh, to design a health system that rewards value over volume. Uh, this conceptual framework was really uh, put to work in 2014 in the form of a funding proposal to CMS, uh, and then we were notified that we, we received uh, funding, four years of funding, uh, that started in 2015 to plan and implement our state innovation model project. Now I'll get into what, what that entails. Uh, so our approach, uh, since we've received this funding, has, has really been one, one of we will use the blueprint for health innovation that was designed with stakeholder input as our vision and move towards that vision in the next three years with our state innovation model project. And the way we're thinking about doing it is this. We will put payment policies into place. We will test those payment policies. We'll also put some measurement infrastructure and some investments into communities into place. But we're also going to stand up some committees and some communication protocols and processes so that we are uh, looking at those policies and investments on an ongoing basis. Because this does have to be an iterative improvement uh, process, more so than putting something into place and letting it run for three years and, just, and seeing how it did. Uh, so we're really looking at this as a foundation for an ongoing conversation for policy and investment change uh, over the long term. So here are our strategies for our state innovation model project. The first three there, uh, patient center medical home, community health innovation region, and accountable system of care are what we call our strategic initiatives. And the bottom three, the health information technology, collaborative learning, and stakeholder engagement are what we call strategic supports. So really the goal of our patient center medical home is to leverage the foundation that we have in our state with primary care and patient center medical home uh, that was really uh, part of the success of large-scale initiatives such as um, the Michigan primary care transformation demonstration. Uh, so we want to uh, improve on that existing foundation, support where it exists across our state, and uh, put policies into place that broaden the ability for providers to participate in patient center medical home payment models and, and models of care. Uh, and also allow them some flexibility to staff their care teams as it relates to their specific patient population. The other thing we want to test over the course of the State Innovation Model Project are payments that are tied more, uh, more explicitly to performance. The Community Health Innovation Region uh, initiative is, is what I would consider makes our SIM project a little more unique than other states. Uh, so with the Community Health Innovation Region initiative, we're really looking at building upon existing uh, community coalitions that are already into place and testing uh, the definition of requirements of those coalitions and testing holding those coalitions accountable for those requirements and even modifying those requirements as it relates to feedback we get from those coalitions. Uh, but we want to focus them in on consolidating existing community health needs assessments that are uh, sometimes they're in place uh, in a consolidated way already, but not always. Sometimes there's multiple organizations that have multiple assessments that say slightly different things. So we want communities to come together in this, in this model and prioritize 
uh, as a group what their priorities are going to be and then prioritize as a group what their improvement plan is going to be along those priorities. And we're bucketing really two, act, uh, two pieces of activities that these, uh, these communities will undertake. Uh, the first one is what we call clinical community linkages. Uh, and so and this is really um, a way for the healthcare system to start moving into uh, the community resources and what's available for their patients as it relates to some of the social issues that may be coming up when providers are talking to their patients. Uh, the other, the other uh, bucket of activity we're expecting to fund with our SIM grant uh, relates to policy and built environment changes so that in the long term we're creating communities that promotes wellness and, and health. Uh, our vision for the Community Health Innovation Region is really one of um, advanced sophistication and organization. Uh, we want to test that do these requirements uh, bring communities together in a, in a more organized way, in a more standardized way so that healthcare systems can really understand how they can partner with community resources uh, in an efficient and effective way. Uh, finally, the Accountable Systems of Care Initiative. This is essentially uh, groups of primary care providers, so you can think about uh, accountable care organizations or health systems or uh, POs or PHOs as being accountable systems of care. Uh, and we expect these sorts of partners moving forward to uh, already have or have the ability in the near future to put uh, advanced payment models into place, and I'll get to that uh, in a moment. So our rollout strategy. Um, as I mentioned, our PCMH initiative is essentially going to start statewide if we want to think about it that way because we do have uh, patient center medical homes across our state. Um, and so we will start with that foundation and expand upon the patient center medical home initiative in our five SIM regions. So we have selected five regions where we will pilot out uh, the community health innovation region element of our plan. Uh, and we will support MyPICT across the state as it exists and allow for uh, expansion of patient center medical home in the first year within those five SIM regions. And then we have a plan to expand beyond those five regions over the course of the SIM project. Essentially what we uh, expect to do with our SIM grant in these five regions is fund what we're calling a single backbone organization. And so this backbone organization would essentially serve as the convener or the accountable manager uh, of the SIM grant uh, and bring the partners together and facilitate planning, facilitate design, and then execute contracts as it makes sense to achieving that local operational plan. In the near term, we're going to focus the activities of these five regions on reducing ED utilization. So we recognize that our community health innovation region is a concept and it needs to be operationalized. So we need the assistance of our local implementers to help us define what an operational model will be for them and therefore what an operational budget will be for them and their partners. Uh, so we'll be working with them, but we only have three years. And so we need to show value for this concept, for this operational model that we're going to be designing in three years. So we're focusing, uh, at least initially, their efforts on emergency department utilization. And we're also really trying to focus in on activities that we, we know will show value in three years. And so one of the ways of doing that is focusing clinical community linkages and the importance of the accountable systems of care in those regions uh, in that effort. So existing accountable uh, systems of care within those regions will be eligible for parts of the SIM grant funding uh, to assist in executing clinical community linkages or other activities as it relates to the community health improvement plan uh, of that region. We recognize that this sort of activity, these partnerships that I'm talking about are, are new uh, for, in some cases. Not all of the healthcare organizations or the community organizations are familiar with this sort of partnership uh, or have it in place or even really know how to start it. So we're putting in place what we call a collaborative learning network to support these regions. And you can really think of this as a continuous quality improvement sort of approach to put together these partnerships on a small scale, test them out, and modify them and improve them moving forward over the three years so that we're, we're building towards more systematic connections between healthcare organizations and community organizations. So th I think this is an important story to sort of highlight for you all at this conference. Uh, Many times when people think of SIM, they think of payment reform, and that's certainly the case given CMS's uh, emphasis of this throughout. 
And it's been sort of an interesting ride as we look at our payment reform strategy. So I, I think it would be helpful for this audience uh, to hear sort of what the Michigan experience has been like uh, along the lines of putting together a payment reform strategy. So as a SIM state, we are authorized to put together a uh, customized Medicare participation agreement for multi-payer alignment. And we've always known that. Uh, and buried within all of the guidance of how to uh, come to agreement with Medicare of what that multi-payer alignment model is going to be, there's a little nugget that says this agreement must be new, a new, novel, and unique demonstration to Medicare. So. The, the model that they would agree to implement cannot be like anything that they are already doing in any other state or area. So we were really basing our model at that point off of, off of the MyPIC model and moving forward with something that would, would be similar to MyPIC, but there would be modifications so that it would be considered new, novel, and unique. Uh, and then we were also moving forward with more system level uh, payment reforms so that we could start tying specialists and hospitals, um, incentivize them to participate and support in the goals of our patient-centered medical home. And that model was really uh, turning out to be uh, something similar to like a shared savings upside only payment. So uh, that's, that's sort of where we were coming from and where we were headed. And before I get into what happened, I wanna refer to this uh, framework here. And this is the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network framework. Uh, this is out of a federal DHHS effort to convene payers, purchasers, and providers uh, to come to a common commitment of moving the percentage of medical spend towards the right of this framework, so more towards uh, what they're calling advanced payment models. So going back to how I described our payment strategy up until recently, uh, we were really falling in that category two and maybe in, even into the 3A category. So that's what, what we were looking at implementing uh, in our state. And then uh, a, a few announcements uh, happened about a month and a half or two months ago. Some of you may be familiar with some of these. And I'm going to go through them uh, very briefly and sort of give you uh, some perspective of how those announcements have impacted how we're looking at rolling out our payment reform strategy. So the first one is the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus initiative. Uh, so this is the uh, PCMH Plus initiative that's come out of Medicare. Uh, and it signaled several things to states, but just to highlight a few for you, the, the one thing it did signal to us was that there was some reservation over a potential for duplication of payment issues when states start combining ACO, shared savings upside only with patient center medical home payments. Um, so we, we took that signal very seriously and, and we've been in constant contact with CMS about what that means um, and they've quoted federal statute to us as well. Um, but they're, they're, they're really, they haven't come to really a way to carve those apart and so from a federal perspective it, it amounts to a duplication of payment issue. Uh, but most importantly, uh, the CPC Plus really signaled to states uh, that there was a new bar for new, novel, and unique when states are start, start to pursue a customized Medicare participation agreement. Uh, so it was really overnight that our bar for what uh, Medicare was looking for and what new, novel, and unique really meant uh, changed. Uh, and and I, we are interpreting that correctly based on uh, conversations we've had with CMS. Um, so that's really one of the main uh, implications of the CPC Plus announcement that occurred a couple months ago. The second announcement I want to highlight is the Medicare Access, what is it? Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act, or MACRA. Uh, this signaled a couple things to states, and the first one I want to highlight is uh, the Medicare's definition of what an advanced payment model is. Uh, so it did include in the rules what they would consider an advanced payment model to be. Uh, they also uh, included I don't know if incentives is the right word, but it included ways to move providers towards uh, those advanced payment models. And really the definitions for their advanced payment models would fall under the 3B and the 4, category 3B and 4, under that framework we just, we just looked at. Um, and, it, and it really implied that shared savings upside only is, is not a, a payment reform. It, you know, they've classified it as really a P for P sort of program. Um, so it, it started to seem like our payment reform strategy was antiquated um, pretty quickly. 
Uh, the finally, I'll just mention, and we're still uh, certainly exploring this like many other states, but the Medicaid managed care regulations um, do offer some, some cause for potentially concern over pass-through payments. Uh, so that we're still looking through those and, and looking to get some TA to verify our interpretation is correct. Uh, but there is some regulation around pass-through payments for managed care organizations that we need to take a close look at and, and think about how that relates to the state's ability to really be prescriptive uh, about payment reform with uh, entities that they're holding at risk uh, for capitated payments. So all that is to say, uh, we, along with uh, other SIM states have been reassessing uh, the implications of these announcements on our payment reform strategy. And so what we've landed on is that we will move forward as a state to design uh, and negotiate a Medicare customized uh, agreement for our patient center medical home uh, initiative. We expect that to take probably 12 to 18 months, uh, but we've been engaging stakeholders pretty heartily uh, from the provider as well as the payer perspective on, on what we believe as a state should be the right approach. And what we've heard is that the customized option is the right approach. So we are going to move forward with that, but it does uh, put us into a sticky situation from a timeline perspective. Uh, because the, the Medicare agreement for the my picked pro project ends at the end of this year. So when we look at the fact that we need 12 to 18 months to put in a Medicare customized agreement, uh, that doesn't line up with, with that timeline. Uh, so we have been engaging uh, partners around an interim patient-centered medical home payment model. And so what we're thinking there is we will institute a, an interim payment through our, our Medicaid health plan uh, program, uh, and we will work with our commercial payers to, to continue their PCMH payment models as, as they exist, uh, or as they prefer them to exist moving forward. And from a Medicare perspective, we're really looking at leveraging a couple codes in the Medicare uh, to, to bill temporarily. And we've engaged providers on can this, can this work for you? Can you sustain for, for a period of time on these? And, and the majority of the feedback was yes. Uh, so we would be using Medicare codes, uh, interim Medicaid payment model, and then working with our commercial payers uh, while we uh, collaboratively design and then negotiate a customized approach with Medicare. And we would use the MACRA rules and we would use the CPC Plus announcement as sort of our, our bar to pursue that customized option. Uh, and then from a, from a system level perspective, uh, we know that Medicare has incentives to, to move providers more towards those th Category 3B and Category 4 payment models. Um, so depending on how that effort begins to shape out over the near term, we would be looking to leverage the state's uh, purchasing power uh, as well as contractual power uh, to leverage those APM definitions as a policy lever to move, to move where we can payers more towards those categories of payment. So that's kind of where we were, what happened, and where we've been. Uh, this is, again, about a month and a half or two months since these announcements came out, so it has taken us time to process this information, understand the implications, and then re-strategize. But at this point, what I've given you is a sort of a conceptual level of, of how the state is thinking about these announcements as it relates to, to payment reform. And I, I, I can't uh, come to the Connecting Michigan Conference and not say anything about health information technology, and hopefully I, my colleague Kim is somewhere that can help me and wave at, there she is, in case I'm a little off base. Uh, but essentially, uh, from a strategic standpoint, we are looking at leveraging the, the existing statewide HIE infrastructure that we have in our state uh, and build upon what we're calling foundational use cases. Uh, and so these three here, the Active Care Relationship Service, Health Provider Directory, and Common Key Service, uh, when we think back on our, on our vision for care coordination across the medical system and then uh, building a foundation where we can begin linking into the community and sharing information that way, these, become, these use cases become very important because they essentially define uh, information about a provider uh, that can then be used to inform active care relationship connections between providers and patients. Uh, and then the common key service can begin clarifying that a patient for provider A and a patient for, for provider B, if in fact that is the same patient, uh, that common key service would, would clarify that and allow for information sharing across providers as they are defined in that provider directory. 
So I'll wrap up uh, briefly with some updates and then give you a sense of what we're looking at over the next six to eight months, and I should be on schedule for some questions. Uh, so what I want to start with is we are still in our planning year for Michigan. Uh, so although the grant did start February 1st, 2015, we did negotiate with CMS a no-cost extension uh, of six months. So we have until the end of July for our planning period. And this is essentially due to some stakeholder engagement limitations that we experienced last year from May to October. Uh, some of you may be aware that our state was bidding our managed care uh, managed care contract at that time. And the RFP for the managed care uh, contract had a significant overlap with the state innovation model. And there was also, at that point, some uh, potential for out-of-state bidders. Uh, and so in order to uh, not compromise the integrity of that bid process, we did fall silent for that period uh, so that we weren't, weren't potentially at putting some bidders at an advantage in that process. Uh, so we did renegotiate a, a modified timeline for our first year, and so we are in our planning planning stage. For the first year, uh, a significant amount of effort put went into uh, collecting information about our regions and our organizations across our state as it relates to capabilities for implementing payment reform and implementing clinical community linkages and putting into place policy and built environment uh, strategies for creating uh, good uh, healthy communities. Uh, so a, a considerable amount of time went into the collecting that information and analyzing that information so that we come, could come to a decision on where to start with, with this, these initiatives. And so that kind of helped us land on our five regions. Uh, the, other, the other, I think, important activity that we have uh, participated in over the first year, uh, I think really gets into taking that conceptual framework that came out of the blueprint development and came out of the development of the funding proposal and trying to work that down into a, a deeper level of detail. And as we work down into that deeper level of detail, making sure that it, it is unified and understood and coordinated across at least our department uh, and then out into the, into the external environment with our payers and providers. So um, we needed things for, for folks in the department and for folks outside of the department to react to. And so it was, it was one of the tasks was really taking that conceptual framework and, and, and bringing it down a level into detail uh, and, and then doing some engagement there. We have been working pretty diligently uh, since uh, January uh, about to finalize our operational plan that is due uh, this week. Uh, we did get an extension based on uh, the, the announcements that I referenced uh, earlier, and, and CMS has been very understanding with what those announcements have meant to our strategy as well as I think other SIM states uh, and have been flexible in, in when that operational plan is due. Um, so we were, we were finalizing it and then we've had to finalize it again uh, essentially in light of, of the announcements in the, in the modified direction. So from a timeline perspective, we'll be wrapping up uh, planning and design efforts over the next few months uh, leading into our implementation year. We do plan to uh, begin implementing the interim PCMH payment model, at least within the Medicaid space, uh, but working with our, pay our commercial payers, uh, and we'll, we'll need to roll out an effort with our providers as it relates to building the, building the Medicare codes. Uh, and we'll be finalizing these, these high-level APM strategies that I, that I outlined, as well as that custom Medicare participation option. We do have some engagement act, uh, activities planned over the next couple months uh, so that we're making sure we're collaboratively designing that customized option with, with all of our payers and providers. Uh, over the fall-winter uh, is when the, the local five regions that we've selected will be moving into their planning. Uh, and submitting their operational plan for our appro approval. And we'll really take that operational plan uh, and confirm it with CMS so that we can begin uh, sending funds down to these, these sites. Uh, we will uh, put the interim PCMH initiative into place starting January 1st so that it coincides with the end of the MyPIC demonstration. Uh, and then we're, we're aiming for an early 2017 execution of funding to the, to the community health innovation regions too implement their plans. So that's the 25 minute window into the uh, Michigan's approach to the state innovation model. Um, I've put my email on uh, address on there. Maybe I'll regret that, but um, that's all there for you all to see. And we have about five minutes for questions.
There's got to be a question out there. There you go. Thanks. So are you suggesting that practice with this 12 to 18 month for the practices that are in my picked and, and don't think that they can get by with the, with the Medicare billable codes, are you suggesting or not suggesting that they go through the CPC plus model as well? Or does that mean that they can't be in SIM? What was the last part? It doesn't mean they what? If, if practices participate in CPC plus, does that mean that they aren't eligible to participate in SIM at that point? Great question. Uh, so we sort of asked this question when we were trying to rummage through what our options were. Um, and what we were told by CMS is that uh, they do not want their CPC plus demonstration wherever it may land across the country to be disrupted, if you will, uh, by other payment models that practices may choose to, to go towards. Um, so no practices could not uh, participate in both a custom option and a CPC plus demonstration. Hi, do you know if there are other states that are um, forming organizations such as the Shire that you've described and what sort of success have they had with those? I, I know that there are. Um, I think that the difference becomes the, the focus on health care or the focus on community-based um, resources and, and sort of elevating the priority to be, it, for it to be community-based and for it to be uh, organizing the community re resources in a way that connects to the, to the health care system versus the other way around. So, so there, there are, um, actually Washington is coming to mind, they had a accountable, I want to say accountable health communities, but I think that's that's something else, uh, but they had some sort of uh, model such as that, um, and oh, in Oregon's uh, co coordinated care organizations, um, and so what I've heard that Washington is actually uh, looking at a uh, disrupt waiver for their community-based, um, their accountable health community, or whatever the, the the exact name of the model is. Um, so. I'm going to assume there that if they're pursuing a waiver that it showed some value uh, for sustaining and, and moving forward in their state. 